Ready? You have the cameras rolling? Welcome to Outspoken. This better be good. A show about... Floods, mutant, plagues, man-eating plants. Actually, it's about thought-provoking, compelling conversations with people who have something important to say, a good story to tell, or knowledge we can learn from. Oh, good for you! And now... Hold on to your butts. Here's Scott and Curtis. Hello and welcome to The Outspoken Show with Scott and Curtis. I'm Scott, and our co-host today, as always, is Curtis. Hey, Curtis. Hey, Scott. Good to be with you. Good to be with you, too. So we are 16 episodes in, and the show's growing, and uh, it's pretty dang cool. And uh, Curtis and I are, uh, are are thinking about the format all the time and the focus of what our show is. So with that said, if you're listening or watching and, and you have some feedback for us, please give us some comments, email us, tell us what you like, what you don't like, uh, what you'd like to see, because we would love to hear from you. And with that said, Curtis, is gonna, he's going to in- introduce our guest today. So Curtis, take it away. Thanks, Scott. Uh, one of the pieces of feedback that we've uh, we've divined is is that our audiences really seem to like uh, guests like the one we got on today who who combine uh, business experience and sort of an, an interesting life arc um, into some great lessons learned that we can we can share with the uh, share with the audience and and also have maybe some specific uh, pieces of expertise that they can share as well. And today is just such a guest. I'm proud to welcome Don Canada Jr., who is uh, both a friend and uh, a next client. Uh, we kept in touch over the years, and, and Don's a really great guy. Uh, Don is an expert on the Affordable Care Act, aka o- Obamacare. Uh, he's an entrepreneur who's built, sold, and rebuilt a health insurance brokerage, a very successful one. Um, and somewhere around the age of 45, he turned his sedentary dad bod, which all of us uh, – tend to lapse into, except for the other two guys on the screen, uh, turned his health around completely by becoming an Ironman starting at age 45. So we'll hear a little bit about that. Uh, Don's also taken an interesting digression into the Wagyu beef uh, <laughs> market, and we'll, uh, we'll hear how, how that went for him and, and how he turned, uh, turned into an enthusiast for Wagyu beef and, uh, and what that's meant for him. So, uh, Don, let's let's maybe start with. Um, do, do you recall how we met? Oh, absolutely, Curtis. Absolutely, it was uh, it was a big intersection in my life. Also, you uh, caught me coming off a strategic coach class that I was going to for a number of years, and um, recognizing your ability to listen, and then quickly identify the problem, and even better, uh, you know, for, for coming with solutions just to help somebody was the first thing I picked up about you, Curtis. That's why I've kind of hang around for a while. <laughs> I got to second that one. I think, I think that's a, that's a, you've nailed it the way Curtis is. It kind of takes that combination of all kinds of experience and, and insights and really gives you a point and answers when he's out there. Anyway, I'll, I'll second that. Yep. And, uh, we, we were on a plane. I was coming back from Chicago O'Hare, <laughs> and, uh, you know, leading up to that, I had, uh, you know, quote unquote, freed myself from my business by enrolling in a strategic coach program, Dan Sullivan's program, and uh, was in my sixth year of that program. So we met in like 2014, 2013, Curtis, is that right? Something like that. Yeah. I think maybe even earlier than that. Maybe 2012. Yeah. And uh, so uh, he was a good ear to talk to. I mean, I hate sitting on a plane, not doing anything. My mom said when she used to pick me up in daycare, I was the only kid that wasn't sleeping in the room and I was twiddling my thumbs like this. So uh, we had a great conversation, bonded immediately. And I uh, didn't take me long to hire Curtis to bring him on my team at that time and the team that I was building. And let, let's talk about that team, Don. So uh, your first business in Austin that I, that I know about was um, Silicon Benefits. And how did, how did you start that business? I know it was a, you know, a long, hard journey to build it up to the level of success you had. Uh, tell us about that. It actually started when I was eight in Houston, Texas, waiting for golf balls in the pond and uh, <laughs> selling them to the golfers at the tee box. And uh, Houston's nice. got a Houston's not known for water, and uh, so we had a lot of algae. We lived on the golf course, so we had a gazebo and a deck that looked out to the ninth hole or whatever it was. It was a par three. 
So quickly, I was ready to make money even before 10. So uh, the problem was that I got caught by my mom after a couple of months. It wasn't that the friends were telling her what I was doing. She heard that. But I came out of the, the, the pond one day and I was totally blue because they put blue dye in there to kill all the algae. <laughs> And so at eight years old, she asked me if I was waiting for golf balls. And I said, no, ma'am, I'm not. And she looked at me and she goes, you're going to have to learn how to tell a better lie than that, by the way. So uh, that's when kind of things got cooking. And I've always been entrepreneurial and wanted to. My dad wouldn't let us have a motorcycle. So my brother and I saved up enough money, built a little shed on the lot next door like he wouldn't recognize it and uh, had, our, had our own little motorcycle track and club going on. So it's uh, it started a long time ago. Um, I think what's important for me is that, you know, this to start and I'll be succinct is that United Parcel Service was a huge impact on my life. Uh, that was really I was in college. I had the ultimate college job. Uh, and uh, with the exception, I went to work at 10 at night till four in the morning and went to class. If I didn't wake up in the library in a pool of drool or something trying to stay awake and um just the industrial engineering, the efficiencies of such a large organization that dates back to the Teamsters in the 30s and stuff. It was it was it was an education on top of the education I was getting in school and uh, thrived on that and uh, built my first team there. So I had 35 employees. And what happened was the about a year into employment, long hair, kicking ass, sweating, using his workout and going home quickly and uh basically get paid a lot, like eight bucks an hour back then, guys, in the 1987s. Yeah, yeah. So, wow. big money. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, you know, health was insurance was $5. Minimum wage. Yeah. Well, it was probably like three twenty five or something back then, right? Or even even less. Yeah, but anyway, the, the you, could, you, could, you could be a part-timer at UPS and have a baby for like $5. Uh, so yeah. their health care was unbelievable because of the unionized company. So I just got a lot of education out of there when I, when I, the manager came to me after a year. He said, hey, Don, we want you to go into management. And I was like, yeah, I'll talk to you all after college. I mean, I'm working here to pay for school. And he says, no, we want you to run the ship that you're on. We're, you're replacing the guy that's there. You're already leading the team and he's a worthless boob. So it's you. <laughs> so I uh, I got to manage people for the first time. That was that was uh, and, and got to deal with a guy my age that I sat next to to a truck driver that's been on the circuit for freaking 30 years. And I uh, learned a lot of how to motivate people and uh, how to get shit done, basically, in a high production facility. And uh, there's a lot of funny stories that come out of that, but I'll share them for you all another day. Um, so when I got out of college, I uh, told UPS just to get me the hell out of Wichita Falls, Texas, which is my birthplace and where I went to school and had great memories with my grandparents, my dad's mom and dad up there. Um, time I wouldn't trade for anything, actually. Mm. And... Uh, they came to me and asked me to, to, to go into the marketing department. They said, we want you to head up the marketing department. So I did that. I, um, they, they were just introducing the next day air letter. So I was the regional guy for Wichita Falls and surrounding areas, even in Oklahoma. So their marketing so just department doing, that they were talking about, that was a, a, the regional marketing department. Regional marketing position okay. in that area. Yeah. So and I, you know, got my first suits and, you know, I was doing stuff and I recognize I'm a disruptor. So I recognize what's wrong. Like Curtis does. I know that's another trait of yours is, is that these next day or letter boxes were sitting there collecting dust. And I mean, shit, it was like $7 back then to send the next day or letter and get it there tomorrow, which was hot stuff. That was before the FedEx craze. And, and uh, so I figured out that, Basically, if we clean the boxes up and make them more attractive, like I want to come get an envelope out and fill it out and send it. And I teach the drivers who are ignoring the boxes to help promote the product. You know, so when you're in there delivering a package, tell them there's an next day letter center right down the street. A long story short, we had 15 dead boxes and I generated seven to 10 parcels out of each box within a pretty quick 90 day period to, to you know, just get on the ground and start generating revenue. So um Went to interview, uh, UPS was stringing me along. Uh, I wasn't where I wanted to be. I wanted to be in Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston. I mean, heck, I don't care. Just get me out of Wichita Falls. And I uh, had a lady that was rare in upper management with United Parcel Service named Pearl. And um, I called the, the, the Pearls. That's a good Texas here. name, isn't it? <laughs> it is. And she, she, was, she was a dominant female. I mean, she's in a man's world and a unionized yeah. company on management side. And so she looked at me and she said, hey, you need to go do something else. And I was like, what? I mean, I got brown blood. I got a thrift plan. I got a 401k. 
I mean, I was told if I just work here for 20 years, I'll have a million dollars, man. That's what, that's what you told me. She was, oh, don't worry about that. She goes, you're a smart kid. You need to go do something else. I was like, I don't understand. Wow. Wow. That's cool. It was, it was genuine. And, 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 uh, what she really taught me was, and we had a conversation about it was that I was in 1993 and affirmative action was just freaking starting to blow the doors off. So what, what that really translated to is UPS had a promotion within formula. So if you started out at the bottom two for one going up, so every two they promoted, they'd hire one outside. And uh, she told me, so, uh, you know, white college boy with a good GPA, you're going to be in Wichita Falls for about three to five years. And I'm just telling you that you don't want to do that probably. So that was one of my great intersections on having a great education and stepping out to, hey, I want to start my own business. And wow. um, I was talking to my dad and uh, he told me, he said, hey, the fastest way to six digits is to get in the insurance business and learn about residual income. I said, well... I don't want Your to be the insurance. insurance business. My, my dad's always been uh, he's, he's an association manager. So he, he manages multiple associations, but he always built with an insurance license. He always builds in the medical programs back in the old association heydays. And he, he, he made as much money on that as he did being paid to be an executive director. And it was all part of their contract and what they did. So uh, and then he's done the Austin boat show that you've been to Curtis before. So my dad's the poobah building that, bringing all the oh, dealers nice. together and making that happen. And then, you know, he, yeah. he, he did well because of the float coming in the door. So he has some background in it, but he always hid behind the fact that he was, you know, he had an insurance license and that's how he derived some of his income. So long story short, I looked at him and I said, Hey, you know, I don't want to be the insurance man. Those guys are like lie, steal, cheat, sleep with other people's wives and smoke cigars and lose all their hair. And he, <laughs> he sat there and apologies to all our insurance sales. <laughs> viewers. I think the title is outspoken. Should it be bespoken? Should y'all change the title? There you, to go, there, you go. there you go. So anyway, I, I, I had this nice pause. My dad's very profound and he's brilliant. And he goes, well, it's like Bill Cosby talking to me to make it even more colorful for y'all. He goes, well, <laughs> you, you don't have to do it that way. Mm, good, good so point. There. So I really built a business on being the antithesis of the life and health insurance agent. I show up for work, tell the truth, do what's in the best interest of the client 100% of the time. Everything else will take, be taken care of. Now that's so, a novel thought. Simple <laughs> substance. And it's, 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 it's not out there with the internet tech startups these days, guys. Yeah, I love it. No, it's, it's, it's rare in many fields for sure. Mm -hmm. So, so your focus was, was group health for small to mid-sized companies. Yes. Went to work for Prudential after UPS real quickly, a uh, high intensity training class had 98 people. Me and a CPA were the only two standing after six months in the business. And I looked at Ron and I said, shit, man, it's just you and me. And he goes, I'm going back into accounting, dude. It's just you. So I was the only one that came out of that class. And all they were teaching me to do is ask you how much money you had in your pocket. Sit down, Mr. and Mrs. Dallas, Texas. So I gave the big middle finger to that. Um, found went, went on a mentor search. So that's how I ended up in Houston, Texas. I went to friends of my mom and dad and they were in the business and asked them that, hey, I don't need a paycheck. I need an office, a phone and a computer. And I, I, I need somebody to teach me what's going on in this stuff. So I went through a selection process. First guy I met, you could tell if you dropped a dollar on the floor, he'd hand it back to you and tell you you dropped a dollar on the floor. And um, that was the best thing that's ever happened to me from an influential standpoint outside of my parents. And a um, good friend of mine still today, 30 years later. And uh, UPS taught me to learn everything. So you learn everybody's job. There's no weak link in the chain. As a manager, if one of my guys were sick. I had a rule that you had to bring it in a mason jar. You throw up in a mason jar to prove it or you're not really <laughs> sick. And then if you weren't, then I could cross over to the employee union side and I could do your job. So I had to learn everybody's job. So that's what I did in Bill's office is that within a five-year period, I learned the 30-year COBRA lady, the administrative lady, and just really macked everything out. So then I moved to Austin. So I had a great stint in Houston. Silicon Benefits is in play, got a thriving, growing practice, uh, building a team and um, had a child and needed to get out of Houston and get back to Lake Travis, Texas to replicate what I grew up with. That's quite a background, quite a, quite a story to get to where you, where you were. Now, somewhere along the lines, 
um, you realize the toll that this this lifestyle was taking on your physical health, taking on your body. And uh, and I wanted to get to that and, and what you did about that, um, because at the age where most of us have uh, just given up and gone to the doctor and said, give me a pill for everything that ails me. You said, no, I'm I'm going to take control of this and and uh, and attack it. And yeah, Nancy Pelosi made me do that. Nancy Pelosi yeah. made me do that. Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> well, on that note, uh, we'll, we'll take a quick break and we'll be right back with our guest, Don Canada Jr. Yeah. Are you tired of working outside in the heat? Do you hate your boss? Do you want to get paid to sit on your ass and talk for a living? Well, if you answered yes to the last question, then voiceover might be for you. But if you think it's as easy as buying a microphone, hooking it up to your computer, and all of a sudden you're going to get paid, think again. It's just like your mom told you. You got to go to school. You got to go to school. And you need to talk to actor, voice actor, director, and producer, Jonathan McFadden of Prodigy Talent Training. I'm Jonathan McFadden. Jonathan works in the business, so he knows the ins and outs, and he can help you excel in the field you want to. Audiobooks, animation, video games, radio ads, and of course, voiceover. But you can't wait around because classes fill up fast. So get over to Calendly.com slash Prodigy TT. Yeah, that's a weird word. Here, I'll spell it. C-A-L-E-N-D-L-Y dot com slash Prodigy TT. Click new student interview and pick a time that works for you. So listen to your mom and go to Prodigy Talent Training. You gotta go to school. And we're back with the Outspoken Show, Scott and Curtis, and our special guest today, Don Canada Jr. During the first segment, we heard about Don's journey to a thriving uh, group health insurance business uh, in a very circuitous manner. Um, but somewhere along the, on the way, he realized the toll that was taking on his body. And, and about the time most of us decided to hang it up, um, Don decided to to attack the, the the causes of his of his discomfort and, and displeasure, and Don, you decided to become an Iron Man at somewhere around the age of what forty five? Is that right? Yeah, they do age brackets, so I was in the forty five to forty nine, and you know you always want to be the the, the younger guy in that bracket because you know forty nine year old is a little bit older than a forty five year old, but uh, yeah, so that was the <laughs> bracket that I hit, and was glad when I hit the fifty year bracket, fifty year old bracket because I was the young guy again with my. Uh, <laughs> so, so, so Don, and you had some um, novel inspiration for this. You you talked to that about that before the break. Who was your novel in, your inspiration for this? Well, so Nancy Pelosi is, is the one that made me do this. I, um, I uh, basically uh, was very fascinated even back in 2010 that I had access to Congress.gov and basically C-SPAN was broadcasting the healthcare summit back in that day, which was eventually what y'all know is the ACA now. And um, when, when all the sound bites started coming out and could care less which way people vote just that they vote um the 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 most disastrous words i ever heard was we have to pass the bill to find out what is in it amongst the fog of the controversy <laughs> and i was like that is the most counterintuitive thing i've ever heard this is my livelihood that woman makes me want to poke her eyes out right now <laughs> i mean holy cow and so quickly i figured out that our senators weren't reading the bill Yep. And it was publicized. And yeah, it's 3,593 pages or 3,503. So to be clear, the Affordable Care Act now is over 33,000 pages. It's, you know, Mitch McConnell's got a picture to where it's stacked up, you know, almost a story high, right? I didn't read all 33,000, all right? I read PPACA, the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act, which is technically HR 3590 and HB 4872, which is amassed to about 3,500 pages. With my industry knowledge and experience, being able to read the legislation, that's one thing my mentor taught me is always read the legislation. You'll be 10 years ahead of your competition, always, because it's so slow to drag in, that uh, I started reading it. I, I, I went to my office and that's probably the first time I checked out from the 15 hour day. And I was like, hey, this could put me out of business. 
And it actually it did put 50% of my competition as brokers and agents out of the business by the advent of 20. Can I just stop you on that point, Don? That's, that's really profound. Um, in a heavily regulated industry, that piece of advice you got from your mentor is fantastic. Mm -hmm. You know, Good read point. the actual legislation that will be coming down the pike because it will put you ahead of the competition by a significant margin, right? Um, Positive and negative is nobody else is reading it, including my competition. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Scott and I've been in that situation too, where if, if you if you have an idea of what legislation is coming, what legislation uh, portends, you know, assuming it survives the next administration, um, you know, it's the slow roll when you're talking when you're talking about government regulation. But you know, once that snowball is rolling downhill, it's awfully difficult to stop, and it will it will cream you if you're if you're not prepared for it. So that's, and we saw that in the banking industry, we saw that in the savings loan industry, we saw that in the airline industry, we saw you know, any number. It's, right? it's so happening it's, again in the 401k industry, it's happening again now industry. in my industry, and there's a whole nother platform on broker compensation and transparency that we might get to a little bit later. Electronic but, medical records for, you know, practice, yeah, small yeah, practitioners yeah. office, all so, kinds so, of stuff, absolutely. So Don, Don, what, what, so you, you said you read it. Um, tell us your biggest takeaways from it. What are the what are the few yeah, things you went oh, crap. well? I mean, so one, I want to I want to let people know that um, when I was in seventh grade um, and, I, and out at the lake, my mom thought I had reading comprehension problems. So I went to St. Edwards University as a young kid and sat in front of a lady that I've actually tried to find. I can't find her. Her name's Debbie Boatwright. And, and basically she looked at me and she goes, it's not moving fast enough for you. You don't have any comprehension problems. I'm going to teach you how to speed read. So I learned how to speed read in eighth grade nice. and it's chunking and skimming and it's always stayed with me. So to be very, very transparent and candid, like I always am, I started skimming through the legislation. The first thing I recognized at page 800 or so was that, holy shit, this isn't about health insurance. This is a wellness revolution baked into healthcare reform. And there's a tremendous amount of tax to pay for it coming at us. Yeah. And so Nancy Pelosi also says, and I, totally wholeheartedly agree with that it's about diet, not diabetes. So we, we need to keep track with the fact that when, when I spoke to the CPAs, hey, hang on, e hang, hang on, Don. we don't, we don't fat shame on this podcast. And I, I you yeah. <laughs> know, well, <laughs> actually a disease. Wait, I'm sorry. We played with two names, the unspoken or the outspoken. So there you, we're, go. <laughs> there you go. There you go. No, she didn't get that one it. right though, because what, what, what they're doing and you want to translate it back into financials is that, it's a big social movement, and this is what I want everybody to always keep in mind. The, the entire objective of the Affordable Care Act was access to care funded by subsidies, tremendous subsidies. Okay, so access to care is what's, what, what the main initiative is. Getting, you know, and it's in the news even today, if you listen to anybody, you know, they, they don't want that consumer to pay any more than $5 and have free this and free that and free that. Do, do Don, I'm, I'm really confused here because what you're telling me is different than what I've heard because I was heard, I heard over and over during the debate and even after the debate that we were going to pay less money and get more stuff. So I'm confused. What, what, what am I missing? Well, uh, it's how, how they, how they distributed the money, right? Follow the money would be, be one of yeah. the ways to do that. Um, there's a famous author in the books underneath my computer to appease you guys, but um, there's a lady that's a Harvard professor named Regina Herslinger. And, and that's really where, you know, I'm, my, my mentor taught me to be a legislative geek and read legislation and then get a lot of summary content and become thought leadership in that area. Um, when I picked up her book on who killed health care reform, who killed who killed health care, which, again, is the insurance companies, the government, uh, the pharmaceutical companies and uh, hospitals. Yeah, Because four or five, de four decades ago, I don't know about you, but I mean, insurance was, or not insurance, but healthcare was not expensive. It wasn't bad at all. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and all of a sudden now it's just nuts. And, and I'll say, you know, the, I went through a time when I paid cash for, for um, anything that went wrong in my family. And then we did the, one of the medical share programs and they were pretty well. And when you stack them up against the way that insurance and things act now, it's insane. Yeah, it's still the same concept. And, and to be clear, the MediShares aren't insurance. It's a pooling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's sharing. But, 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 but the same things. And they're very profitable. And there's thousands and millions of families that 
dig that. To answer your question, Curtis, Her Regina Herslinger wrote the book, Who Killed Healthcare? And, and at that time in 2007, she said it's a $2 trillion medical problem, which represented the size of the economy of China. Okay. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, fast forward, it's a $4 trillion medical problem now. And I don't know, I haven't looked it up lately, but I think China's up to 115 trillion. So they're, they're managing their money better than we are is one thing I'd say right there, right? So they, they have a drastic amount of uninsured people as well. So, so the, 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 the thing that, that's just like, you know, the tax man's gonna get it on one end or the other. Y'all have to understand if we're giving out all these subsidies to all these people that's super significant, then, you know, it's coming back to us in premium. To give you a, 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 a to confirm what you said, Scott, um, you know, back in, I, I've been watching rates like the matrix forever. I can make shit up at this point, almost knowing a little bit of information about you. And so, you know, back in the old days, say pre Obamacare 2005 or before, you could throw a $250 rock for a health insurance premium across any size company, any geography, and you'd be pretty darn close. 250 ahead was kind of the standard, right? And that's the old stuff, $1,000 deductible, 80 20 mm -hmm. stuff. Well, that same premium, and I, I've mapped my brother's case since 1995. And so he used to be an $85 premium for the best platinum PPO plan he could get. In today's market, that, that plan is closer to 1200 Yeah. Jeez, that's nuts. Yeah. 1960, you paid $105 for health insurance back in the day uh, annually. And today it's 12534 so yeah. what's happened is they've thrown a lot of money at it. They haven't fixed the problem. Well, and I'll, I'll just confirm that I've, I've been self-employed since 1995 with a, about a seven year period there in between then and now where I was, uh, I was W2 employee. But uh, when I restarted, it was sometime around 2007. And since then I've been paying my own insurance, you know, self-employment for, uh, for myself and my family. And at some point, you know, I think when we got to, I think when we got to something around uh, $800 a month for Blue yeah. Cross, Blue Shield, high deductible insurance, yep. Yep. I yep. said, yeah, let me off the bus, right? And went and looked into this medical share program. Yep. Um, Scott, same one, I think that, that you were on. And, you know, it's, it's been fine and I haven't had to use it for any catastrophic illness yet, even, you know, and I mean the surgery, but, um, based on Scott's experience, it, it'll work. Right. And, um, two surgeries on it. Two yeah. Surgeries. So, well, so, I, you know, I've, I've actually helped my clients with this over time. I mean, so I'm the guy that, you know, I want you happy. And even if you're not with me anymore and you're happy, that's still the same equation for me. So, so I've helped several people transition and, you know, they're like friends or colleagues that I serviced for like 10 years and I stay in touch with them and say, Hey man, Hey Mark, how's it going? And he'll tell me, Oh, nothing's happened this year. And then we'll talk the next year. Oh, something happened, but it worked. So I don't think you're going to find a lot of horror stories. I'll, I'll give you all something you're missing is that the reason MediShare plans exploded, they were around before Obamacare. The reason they exploded was they were one of the exemptions. If you're an Indian tribe or a church because of the contraception stuff that all went back and forth with the legislators, that's how church plans basically had dynamite lit, lit underneath them to refine those pooling arrangements, cut the fat out of healthcare. That's tremendous, guys. 41% waste on the back end. And if you're a small business in the market today, there's 55% waste on what your agent, broker, or CPA isn't telling you. So there's a, a bunch of money that's complex. People don't want to understand it. So, so we've talked a little bit about the um, the American Health the, or the ACA, and we've talked a little bit about about health share plans. So, kind of look right now at the environment of of all across all those. What would you do right now if if you so say the, the election's twenty twenty four, and uh, somebody gets elected in December, and they say, "Hey, Don, we need you to help fix health care." What would you do? What, what would you what would you change and what what would you do to bring these costs down that are so crazy? Well, my my objective as a capitalist is different than the objective of the social schedule here. So no, but you're you're brought into you're brought into the uh, in, yeah. into the federal government to help to help knock this knock this down. What do you do? I think I think the number one thing that I would do is I would I, I would uh, protect the employers. So here's the problem is, you know, these legislators go into a dark room. They pass stuff into law, whether they read it or not. I doubt it. Nobody's read that 33,000 pages, including me. 
and 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 so and then that becomes law but then you know here's the 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 unfortunate thing of having to run a business now is that they pound you out with compliance there's so much compliance of what exactly. you have to do yeah. to administer what they said you have to do you know if the government administered it I'm not saying it'd be any better but at least it displaces that burden and the time and energy and cost that employers have to deal with to push all this massive legislation into to motion and then the, the 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 big problem is whether it's the uh, consolidated appropriations act right now, whether it's the ACA penalties for the employers on pay or play over 50, or whether it's Cobra back in the old days of the 80s. There's massive fines now. So if you don't think that the infrastructure is being built to, you know, move us towards near universal health care, that's it's not social health care, guys. The next steps near universal health care. That's where we're heading. So I would change the fact that the employer uh, over 50 doesn't have to offer health insurance to their employees. That's one feature. So, uh, so I want to, I want to, I want to hold that thought, Don, because I'd like to circle back and come back with some examples um, that that I'm I'm sure you can spout off the top of your head. Uh, but I just want to also confirm uh, for Scott and for 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 our audience. Don's exactly right when he says uh, he's being quite genuine when he says he's he's all about helping his clients. Um, I reached out to Don early this year and said, hey, you know, I've been on this medical sharing program for, I don't know, 10, 12 years. Right. And uh, I think it's time to um, you know, just reevaluate. Is there something out there? And I know just the guy to ask. And I'm just talk to you, to Don's, I'm talk to you ask me about. I mean, I'll talk to you out of it probably, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he, he asked me like five questions and he said, uh, all right, I'm, I'm going to guess, Curtis, that your rate is going to be this much. Uh, I've, got a, I've got a business. I employ my family. You know, I've got about five people on, on the payroll um, and, and some contractors and so forth. And he said, uh, he said you, you're probably going to end up paying this much, as, which is, you know, I don't know, 6x what, what you're paying now. It's probably not worth it to you, but I'll run the numbers for you just just in case. He came back and he was, you know, was 5.5x. <laughs> he, he was dead on. And he said, look, stay where you're at. Stay where you're at. And so he wasn't, you know, he was in a perfect position to take advantage of, of our, our friendship and our relationship. And, and he didn't. Uh, instead, he used his knowledge to benefit me. And I, that's the kind of guy he is. Appreciate it. You used that knowledge when you were running Silicon and, and built it up here, here in Austin, Don. Um, and we, we were talking about the whole, the whole, um, transition in, into Ironman, because I think you, you saw as well, how part of the healthcare problem is people not taking control or taking accountability for the things they can do to lower their own it's risk. Humor driven. Yes. That, right. that was my, that was my big question. I was going to ask him uh, as well as his you know, where he was at, you know, is it, is it supposed to be the same health care for everybody or, you know, should less healthy people that make different choices pay more for health care? Yeah. So um, Curtis will reinforce, I'm, I'm really all about accountability. Um, I don't think the carrot method uh, motivates me to do anything, getting beat like a, with a stick does. And uh, that, that wellness <laughs> industry, that wellness industry has gone through that. Let me make it real for y'all. All right. So I'm sitting on the couch I've got Nancy Pelosi rev rev reverberating through my head, and and in my first, I'm, I'm first, sorry. Well, and my first problem was that you know that was probably the first time I'm coaching little league baseball and stuff. I can see the pictures on how much I weighed, and and mm -hmm. and uh, that's that's what I was saying that Nancy Pelosi uh, basically put a spark and ignited something in me that hey, I've got to get up and talk to you yahoos about this shit, and I'm not healthy. And so when I was always an athlete, high school level, not, nothing fancy, uh, always involved, active outdoors. But, you know, I, I, my bank account got bigger. My ice cream bucket got bigger. My beers got bigger. And <laughs> basically over time, I mean, I looked down and I was like, holy shit, I'm 34 years old and I'm drastically overweight. And I had fear, guys. My fear was that I just had a son within a couple of years. And I thought about it and I was like, you know what? I'm not going to be able to throw the baseball with him one day. Mm. Yeah, and that that was one of my motivators. So I got I have bird dogs. I hunt quail and pheasant. And the first thing I did was start walking up my driveway with the bird dogs. I got happy feet. I'm not a runner. I was always the don't make me run more than 400 meters coach. 
um, sprinter. And all of a sudden I got happy feet and started running. And then all of a sudden my runs got longer and I was always a fan, fan of the bicycle and mountain bikes and stuff. So I was like, well, I'm gonna get back on a bike. So I got on the bicycle and then bicycle and then running off the bicycle. And then I said, shit, I think I'm, I think I'm becoming a triathlete, man. I'm, I'm, I'm getting my eyesight on that. So I can share with y'all that I'm kind of all in. So I didn't go do many triathlons. I said, Hey, I'm going to do a triathlon in 2012 <laughs> and I'm going to go do the longest one. And so when I got online, go big or go home with Don, I didn't, I didn't even <laughs> tell my wife at the time for a year, I trained for a year knowing that this is what I wanted to do. But once you say it, you got to go do it. And, yeah. and it's not, it's, it's financially expensive and it's a, it's a toll on, on, on your, your day basically. For sure. So I get online and I'm like, all right, I'm a Texas boy. I'm going to find me, you know, a Texas triathlon, going to do the full distance and everything's sold out for like three, four months in advance. I was like, man, it's like 750 bucks. Are you kidding me? So I start searching. I was like, whoo, got one left in 2012, man. It's in May in St. George, Utah. Poof, put the money down. Next two weeks after that, the race director emails everybody that registered and said, this is the longest, hardest race course in North America. And after this race, we're reducing it to a half Ironman. It's not going to be a full anymore, although they just brought it back last year. So now I'm like got the heebie-jeebies. I've, uh, I've trained, but I'm you know about to go learn the difference from a Texas boy, what the difference in a hill and a mountain is, obviously. <laughs> when I get out there with this family stuff and, you know, I'm got a nutritionist. So that's one of the best things I did through the process is I had a nutritionist dial me in on intake and output and uh, I was ready and uh, wrote a, I wrote on my body magic markers. Um, I wrote, I will not quit. And I looked at my son and cried that night and said, Hey man, I don't care what happens out there tomorrow, but I'm not quitting. And so I held on to that. Uh, what, what I didn't, it got worse. So basically the name of the lake was hurricane Lake. I guess I should have paid attention to that one too. Right. <laughs> No shit. 40 mile an hour winds. Oh, highest, D, highest DNF rate of any Ironman full distance at that time was the race I'm in now. Oh, not even swim well. DNF is did not finish. Did not finish. So there was the highest DNF rate. I mean, I saw the 40 mile an hour winds, 40 degree temps. Water was cold. I'm, I'm 40 degrees. Yeah, well, the water wasn't 40 degrees, but the 40 degree temp outside. So we had this big, cool wow. blast, bunches of wind, and I'm watching people getting fished out on boats, climbing up on rocks, and I'm side stroking. And I'm, I've done so much swimming in Lake Travis. I'm like, I can't believe I'm side stroking a freaking first Ironman event, but I had to create a bubble to breathe. So ultimately, I get out like 10 minutes before the cutoff. And then I, I, I just want to get on the bike. I, I mean, I just my whole job is just to get out of the damn water and then go do the other things. And so I start passing people on the bike and I'm like passing a lot of people and, and like hundreds. And it wow. took me a while to figure out that I'm such a slow swimmer. I'm just passing all the slow bikers, basically. <laughs> it's, it's a long distance race, right? Yeah. So uh, I end up uh, coming across the finish line. Um 14 hours and 22 minutes later. So I started swimming at 7 a.m. and about nine something that night, came across the finish line. Guy says, uh, wraps me up with a Mylar blanket. And he goes, you're an Iron Man." I said, yeah, I know, man, thanks. And he goes, can you stand up? And I was like, sure, I can stand up. And as soon as he let go of me, I hit the ground. <laughs> and I was out. I mean, I couldn't wow. even stand up after that. So it, uh, it does take a toll on your body. Curtis, um, you, you, you learn to recover. Uh, I couldn't walk down the stairs the next day on that one, but you do learn how to recover and come back from that stuff and build it up stronger. So it was a, it was a great experience. My son was there to witness what I was doing, dialing in my nice. nutrition, dialing in the physical activity. Um, it was a really cool experience. So I did three more that year. Jeez. And and I know Don's got lots of stories he's competed all over the world if i'm not mistaken about which with the Cozumel, st george texas those have been um I'd, I'd like to hear more of the more of these stories but there's a there's a couple of key lessons i, I want to come back to about the folks you were passing and, and and how you were passing them uh we got we're up against a commercial break so i want to take that real quick and come back with, uh, with more with don canada jr uh stay tuned folks The Infernal Guard Book 3, Severance. The three pieces of an age-old prophecy have been found. The children who will save the world until one goes missing. Now it's up to the Guard to find that kidnapped piece of the puzzle, to sever the links between worlds and stop an invasion from the underworld. 
Will they make it in time? Will this former enemy cooperate, or does her hatred live on? Coming soon wherever audiobooks are sold. Witness the end of the thrilling Infernal Guard trilogy by SGD Singh. We're back with more Outspoken. Our special guest today, Don Canada Jr. Uh, Don was regaling us with tales of his first Iron Man, er, first Iron Man event, um, and he's got several more more stories from that that event, those uh, those trials. But uh, Don, one of the things you mentioned was as you were in the lake swimming, which is the first part of the the triathlon. Mm -hmm. um, you said I was such a slow swimmer that when I got on the bikes and I started passing people hundreds mm -hmm. of people you realize you were just passing the slow bikers and i don't know about you Scott, but to me there's there's a nice business metaphor there mm -hmm. um, which is you know first of all persistence right don't don't give up and and don mm -hmm. said he had magic marker all over his body and made promises to his family he wasn't going to quit right so don't give up um second is find your lane you know find your sport Find find the thing that you can excel at, and it's not going to be everything. Um, and this this is so true in business. So I do a lot of strategy work with with companies, even big companies, and it is it is amazing that executives forget that the purpose of their the purpose of their business, the vision, the mission, the overall strategy, is not to make money. Right? So if it if the goal is to make money. I, I told a, a CFO at a very large company one time, he said, <laughs> we're having the strategy, it was facilitating a strategy discussion for like a $20 billion company and their execs. I said, well, why don't you guys just go buy um, FCA, Fiat Chrysler? It's, it's for sale. And they said, well, well, don't be ridiculous. That's, we're not in that business. I said, yeah, but the strategies, the strategy ideas that you're perpetuating in this meeting also are not part of your mission and vision. They're not driving you forward. They're just they're just cash flow. They're just revenue. Mm -hmm. They're not driving your business forward. They're not risky. Um, so if the goal is to make money, just do that. Just be a conglomerate. Mm -hmm. Just be a Monsanto. But if your goal is is to advance the mission of your business, find the lane. Yeah. Find find the area where you can excel. If you're slow swimmers, then bike. If yep. you're a slow biker, then run. <laughs> yeah. So, so, you know, a couple of things on that. So on the, on the competitive circuit, the most fascinating thing that happened to me in the second Ironman, which is a half Ironman. And, 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 uh, and let me clarify the distances right quick. So a full Ironman was basically a bunch of Navy and army guys getting together in Hawaii in the eighties. And it said swim 2.4 miles, which is good for the Navy guys, bike 112 miles, and then run 26.2, which equals 140.6 you see on the back of people's cars. And then they've earned it. I mean, that's a lot of miles in one day for anybody, right? I was always fascinated by the para triathletes, the people that had dif disabilities and limbs mm. missing in a wheelchair out mm. running me up a hill and stuff. And I mean, and I used to go by them all the time and say, y'all are the real freaking Ironmans, guys. This is nothing compared to that. So I was very humbled in this sport, too. Uh, Cap Tex Tri in Austin has a big, that, that's where the nationals are for the para triathletes. So I had a lot of exposure to that. I actually, um, helped guide uh, a kid that, that's on the circuit that's blind. So you lead him by rope, swimming, biking, wow. running. It's pretty cool. So, so there's a lot of good stuff in there. And the, the things that y'all need to take away from Ironman is that I always recommend everybody should go out and try it because the only limitations y'all have are between your ears, unless you have a physical or mental disability that prevents you from doing it. And I used to tell my family all the time that our family name starts with can, not can't. <laughs> All right. So that's what we do. Um, so the, the things that I translated into business were super important because I I started finally melding my personal and my business life together mm -hmm. and, and, and it became my brand. And I started mm -hmm. speaking and I spoke to thousands of CPAs about the Affordable Care Act and figured out real quickly for your CPA audience. They didn't read it either. They need to call me probably <laughs> because they didn't read it. And it's, you know, and unfortunately, they're the other puppet uh, to the employer side. Those are the two people I feel the most 
sad for is the, the employers of any size and the, the CPAs, they're burdened with all this massive legislation. They're supposed to be doing all this other stuff for you. And it's all in arrears. So, I mean, you are not going to know the penalties until they're there. And he probably didn't even know about him because I'm sorry, he, he deserves not to know about him. There's so much freaking content. It's ridiculous. All right. For anybody. To their hands, hands full of keeping up with tax law. Absolutely. So one of the things I learned with the, the, the CPAs is that they're the most integral part of healthcare reform because of the tax that's generated to pay for all this stuff and all the returns, the penalties and such. I, I was selfish at first, I thought, because I read the bills about me, but figured out real quickly that your CPA and that intimate relationship that you have with your CPA, um, my advice to y'all's audience would be they should be asking the questions your CPA is not asking, okay? Mm -hmm. Hey, listen to this cat. He said something about these A's, like ACA, CAA, and I think there was like a, a, a TCR in there or something. What do we know about that? And, and, and try to spawn those conversations. We had to do that with the doctors back in those days, right? I mean, just don't give them the keys and the checkbook and say, hallelujah. You got to start slowing them down and engaging them in this process because they too are also inundated by, by the cattle herding strategy of, 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 of healthcare reform. You, you know, Don, you, you talked about a couple of things um, about employers and the burden on employers, and that was the regulations that are the burden and just um, that they're carrying carrying the insurance. Would would you consider a world where you divest though divest benefits from from businesses where you separate them and say benefits are benefits and businesses Funny are benefits? You should ask, Scott. <laughs> What's that? Mm, Funny yeah. you should ask. <laughs> yeah, I think he asked a minute ago too, and maybe I didn't answer it uh, I, I, well. Let me let me try again. So you mentioned earlier, Scott, about the you know what's the landscape look like. I mean, I'm I'm a visionary, guys. I'm an early adopter. I read this stuff, and you know I'm typically in a blue ocean strategy model all the time. I'm just sailing off into the next blue thing and creating stuff, not sitting around waiting to pull shit off a shelf or sell things on a commission. All right, so. So what, what I foresee, and, and let me give you some history, is that 2010 was when PPACA passed. 2014 was the brunt of the information. Kids eligible to 26, no pre-existing, all that stuff, all right? So, so in 2014, the individual health insurance marketplace, and I can speak for Texas, but mostly everywhere else except for California, New York, and other places, uh, maybe Florida, is that the individual market, as soon as the government, the, the act said, you have to cover everybody and you have to cover all their pre-existing conditions. I don't think there's a cost to that. And so what did they do? Because it's always trickled back down to our pocket one way or another. The insurance companies dodge it very well. What did they do? They said, we're not offering PPO plans in the state of Texas. We don't, we're just doing HMO plans. So we'll control cost over here, not over there. That same thing, the next segments, my market segmented, Two to 50 employees is a small employer. In Florida, uh, Scott, it's actually one. So it's one to 50. And, and so one to 50 group health insurance is what that means. So if you're a small company and you're purchasing health insurance, you can do that in that two to 50 market. Um, you are not required to offer, sponsor, or pay for health insurance when you're under 50 employees. Most people don't know that. You are not required as an employer, a small employer, two to 50 employees, to offer, sponsor, or compensate somebody for healthcare. Which are, are you offers. seeing? Are you seeing a lot of companies in that level taking advantage of that? I'm seeing that the so if, if the rest of the market's 51 or more employees, and, and and the major markets won't ever change, like the big tech companies and the thousands and stuff. I'm, I I foresee that the same thing that happened to the individual market is happening now, and it's already trending. Uh, in that direction of small employers getting rid of their health insurance is the conversation we're having right here. And, and, and uh, there's also been recent tax changes that uh, legislative tax changes that allow those employers to do it a different way um, with, a, with a different mechanism, as opposed to giving your employees health insurance, going into a dark room, picking it out and coming back and pissing them off with it. Uh, you can actually give them cash and now you can deduct you that know, cash. This is interesting because because much like, I mean, I'm just riffing here, but um, and I don't know this industry super well, but almost like mortgage interest deductions, if you decided as a small business with less than 50 people not to do it, and for some reason there was an incentive that, you know, that the federal government passed that, that made that tax deductible in the same way, certainly would encourage 
that that kind of behavior. Hey, so how about the bonus factor then? How about the bonus factor? Because so one thing Curtis knows about me, I, I'm an I'm an employee centric guy. What's mm-hmm. made me see things a little differently in this industry is that I don't think about the dollars. I've never have. I always think about (laughs) what's happening to that end user, that consumer. And then I work my way back up the food chain to the. I I think we're all, we're all the same. We're just all trying to fix it. So I'm I'm kind of, that's what, that's the dialogue I want to have is how do we fix it? And and I'm thinking about this way. So curious. about So, so so, uh, typically those are the solutions that people pay me for Scott, but I appreciate you tabling it for me. Um, I, I will, I will help. I will help define the problem for you though. Um, yeah, Don, while we're here, I have this insurance question of my specific insurance. Can you answer it while we're here on the show? <laughs> yeah, this new legislation I'm talking about actually lets you pay your Medishare premiums out of it. Nice. So, so what, what the, the, the magic is, guys, that, that the landscape of healthcare reform is changing. All right. So great companies since World War II got great employees with great benefits. I mean, it's the model I grew up with in the 90s. All right, guys? Yeah. What's what's changed is Obamacare. I mean, I can I have maternity insurance, even though I can't deliver a baby. I, you know, I've got I've got stuff that I you know I may not want uh, on my policy. So uh, over over time, uh, this this small group market is going to erode. And 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 so what I suggest that, that's people, all free coverage, right, Don? That maternity insurance that's it's that's all free, built right? in. That's that's, so that's the problem with everything's baked in. So the so one of the things that's in motion right now that's fixing things and what your your audience needs to to, to be aware of is that transparency is taking a huge sweep at everything. Okay, so the legislation has put transparency in play. Um, employers have two things that they need to do of any size, by the way. And if you're a group, if you have a group health plan as an employer, you're subject to ERISA, and the owner and or CEO is the fiduciary. So y'all know your markets really well. What happened in the late 90s- And what, what's ERISA, one, Don? I'm sorry, Employee Retirement Income Security Act, 1984, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was amended uh, by the Consolidated Appropriations Act that's followed the ACA now and extended all these subsidies. Let me get to the root of the equation. You said, Scott, it sounds really good for the employer over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the other thing is, is that there's massive subsidies that are leveraged and, and available to, to people. And what most people don't get is that the, the FPL is 400%. So like you could have a household income to people making a total of $171,000 and still be eligible for subsidy. So that's not real though. That's just my edge of the cliff, guys. What's really happening is, is that people, especially if they have family members, two, three, four deep, are signing up for zero premium health insurance through the exchange, and they're 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 leveraging the tax credits that are available to them. Um, here's the kick: if your employer offers a group health plan, or your spouse has access to group coverage, or you're covered on Cobra or Tricare, you're not eligible for this program. Uh, you're not eligible for subsidies through the exchange. But if you dump the group health plan, expand the rest of the benefits, make your offering more, enhance the communication of everything instead of chasing benefits with the insurance company where they're in control. Uh, people are a lot happier. I can share with y'all, I come across people every week that you know look at me that are a business owner and say, shit, I didn't know I was eligible for subsidy. Well, yeah, you are, Brian. And actually it's zero dollars. He goes, I got zero subsidy. And I was like, no, but zero premium. I know you're 63 years old and I know that your wife's in her fifties and you have two kids still under the age of 26, but I'm telling you it's zero dollars today. So that's that's that that part of the donut hole that that you used to talk about, Don. Uh, the donut hole was uh, Medicare Part D, I think, right? Uh, so by, by by legislative slang, the donut hole came out of Medicare Part D, 2004, and that's where a senior would, you know, have co-pays for their medications, and then it turn off to a certain limit of another thousand dollars out of your pocket, and then y- y- your co-pays would turn back on. So what I'm talking about is the shift. There's a shift of responsibility going on in the health insurance marketplace, and let me let me let me go small big for y'all right quick. If a small company doesn't have to offer health insurance, that could be a competitive advantage. I know you need to hire talent. So the first Uh question about anybody under 50 employees is, are you trying to grow a company, attract, recruit and retain people? Because you probably should stick with your health insurance and stick stick with sending the insurance money, the, the money to the insurance company. However, if you're trying to 
get out of the health insurance business because your business was never about health insurance and you spend all this time and have all this liability and this complexity, then making sure that you build out the benefit offering more robust and you shift the medical off to the exchange. It's about communication, that, guys. Yeah, that, that's really good advice. It's really good advice. So, um, and, and folks, ahead. for for those who want more of this of this kind of uh, expertise, I, I encourage you to reach out to Don. Um, we're gonna we're gonna publish his info about where you can reach him. But he 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 can talk for days uh, about all all of these um, all of these tips and tidbits. And uh, more importantly, he'll help you zero on 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 really exactly what's what's right for your business. Um, Don, I want to, I want to just, uh, come back to, to Austin for a second, because you, you got in tip top shape. When I met you, you were, you know, you were rock hard Ironman guy. You're, you know, it's top of the business world. Um, you know, life, life was pretty good for you. Um, so, some things changed now. Um, what, what happened in that, in that interim period, you, you're no longer in Austin. Um, what, what happened to the, the business? And if you yeah. don't mind sharing a little bit of that, that personal sure. drama, I think there's also some good lessons in that. Sure. Sure. Um, so, you know, I've written some of this stuff down on how I blew up. So, you know, I really blew up my business and in a good way and, and, uh, started, you know, blowing up a, a massive training program at some point before I got to Cozumel, I was training 20 to 24 hours a week. I want to share with, uh, uh, your audience that most people don't think that they can take the time to train. I don't think anybody needs to train that hard. 10 hours a week would, would be a good goal uh, if you're training for a triathlon. But, but what, what I learned to do is to schedule my training as appointments. So I, I learned this as a trick on my boat. I named my boat appointments. So when people called me or told me they wanted to meet with me, I told them I was on appointments. <laughs> I don't want to be a liar and I am on appointments. I named the damn boat appointments. All right. So, so I, I, I did the same after that, that little facet, I actually did the same thing with training. I could only swim in the pool between 12 and one 30. So I finally permitted myself to take a lunch break. And I mean, it's so tough. I've, I've been around a lot of entrepreneurs and we work hard and we work smart and we don't really take care of the number one thing, which is us. And so after I became a triathlete guys, and I got to that peak shape, I mean, one of the things I realized is I'm not going to be just throwing the ball to my kid. I'm going to be throwing the ball to his kid. That's what happened in my transformation. I lost 55 yeah. pounds and uh, it, it was cool. So as I was blowing up on the circuit, business was good. The, the brand was melded together and, and such. I, I've had a couple of opportunities. One, I'm being Compass Bank in the past to sell my book of business. And uh, I'd always you know, told my clients I was married to them forever and so I personally didn't really fit your IT model of scaling, but uh, I'd always kind of declined it. I had that opportunity in 2016 and because of a divorce and some other things that were going on with my team internally, um, that was the opportunity for me to kind of walk away and to be very open. I'd already kind of walked away. I mean, I'm spending all this time training instead of going to work. I mean, on Wednesdays, I had to ride my bike for six hours. You can't go to work and ride your bike for six hours, right? So, <laughs> so I took the opportunity and, and really what I did was I annuitized my book for life uh, with some attrition because of servicing, obviously, but it was across the threshold. I annuitized my book and basically in, in layman's terms, I got them to do all the work to where I could focus on other things. So I don't sit idle well. And, and um, I, um, I had a friend of mine pass away in, in our age group for the first time kind of rocked us. And basically I, um, my, my fiance brought me home as, two bags of jerky from Trader Joe's. And so I had this experience to where I opened the bag and it smelled like butt. I, pull, <laughs> I, I, I pulled it out of the bag and I flipped it. And I was like, this isn't meat, it's rubber. And then I took the dare to put it in my mouth and taste it and I spit it out. And I said, that stuff sucks, take it back. So my fiance is an old Archie Bunker type, type of girl. So she looks at me and she goes, you take it back, jackass. I'm not taking anything back. <laughs> Like, all right. And she was just trying to make me feel good about my friend. So so at that point, I figured out there's not a jerky I've ever had that was worthwhile, actually. Wow. So I, I I was in a WeWork uh, hub hub up there and had some, some, some studio, glass office studio up there. And um, I started messaging to people that I wanted to, you know, I was happily heterosexual, but I wanted to fall in love with the Wagyu purveyor. And I <laughs> swear, like a week later, there was a guy. 
that, that came up to me. And I found myself in Montana. And to be, Curtis had mentioned in, in some of the, the dialogue that, you know, I was, I, I became a Wagyu cattle farmer. I didn't do that, actually. I was in Montana trying to source meat for jerky, some of the finest meat that you could get to do my process. And ultimately, I found Robert Mandavi's wine cellar of Wagyu. I mean, the, the, the ranch, the herd and everything was just pristine and it's all purebred and I won't do a whole Wagyu show for y'all, but it was like the stuff you eat in Japan. Nice. Okay. So as that's happening, I, um, I got what I call the Wagyu wiggles. And even though I went to Montana to go source meat for jerky, I walked out with a contract and bought a bunch of cattle. So, uh, <laughs> risk adverse to the nth degree on that one. So, um, the problem retrospectively is that I changed my model. I went from taking a piece of ass and turning it into a wonderful piece of meat and charging a lot for it to now I'm trying to get rid of all these steaks. And what I say it ultimately happened is that I was building the business. I was taking it into fine restaurants. And right before COVID hit, I watched the girl walk into a uh, with an FBI windbreaker into the bar I was drinking at and she was closing the place down for COVID. So as I invested heavily in a Wagyu herd that's sizable, and, and, and again, I wasn't the farmer, I tapped into a grower's network and I was harvesting, I was helping them harvest up to 40, 40 head of a month. And, and uh, as things, Riata is a famous restaurant in Fort Worth that I hung my hat on because I knew I had top, top of the table meat. So I was just doing top 10 restaurants in Fort Worth and Riata, my buddy James up there called me and he says, hey, man, don't bring me anything else and don't call me anymore. And I was like, it's doing 5000 a week with you. What are you talking about, man? And he goes, we got enough meat in the freezer, man. I don't know how long this is going to last. So I held on to that thing. I'm, I, I, I kind of go down with the ship a little bit, too. And um, I tell people that I uh, went to the University of Wagyu and I spend about the same money you spend to go to Harvard. Wow. <laughs> wow. So scale back. Um, my mom told me a year before I did it that you need to quit wasting your talent and employee benefits and all the stuff that you know and teach people again. And uh, I uh, finally set a date with her and I got to the date and I'm still grinding it out, trying to make something work that my two problems were uh, I had plenty of capital for the first round. I funded that one. The capital after that was the primary problem. And then the distribution I, I had. I have everything else baked, but, but the, the distribution, uh, and believe me, I was in front of HEB and all kinds of players. It's just, uh, yeah. they're, they're, that was one of the components of the implementation that didn't work. So I finally told my mom like April of last year, I think it was, I said, Hey, I'm gonna finally listen to you again. And I'm going to just make jerky for fun again. Cause it became this big ass job that I never wanted. I'm going to just go back to making it for my friends and family and stuff. So, so I did that, converted an old freezer into a cold smoker and went to another gyration of now I'm cold smoking jerky, which is even better than what Curtis had last time. And I uh, decided to go back into the employee. And, and folks, business. the stuff I had was fantastic. And he's got, he's got a lot of different flavors. We'll, we'll let you plug that down too, but. Uh, it's made with love. Amazing. That's all I can say. It's like your mama makes your sandwich. It's made with a lot of love to where all the rest of the yeah. stuff, basically machine cut, processed preservatives, all that stuff. So, so really good. I, I felt, I felt this burden come off of me. All right. And then, you know, I quickly got back into the industry and it's not that I, I like, you know, I was working still with a few of those top clients, but basically it was on autopilot. And, and as I started coming back into the industry, uh, the first thing I want to do is read. I mean, I'm a high fact finder. So I started reading and I realized that shift model, uh, you know, that I was reading about in 2016, that I was already developing a business model around, uh, was still fresh and nobody's talking about it. The reason nobody's talking about it is because they don't want to lose their paycheck. You're not going to have an agent come and tell you or a broker or your CPA to come tell you to cancel your health insurance. I'm not saying everybody should, but I can tell you right now, you're in a dying market from two to 50 from until 2025, not 24. And, and, and you should be considering other alternative options than doing the norm. And, and the savings are tremendous. Um, I, last client I worked with guys, we displaced $300,000 that was getting sent to the insurance company. He put a better package together and made everybody eligible for subsidy for $115,000. And after paying my fees and the cost of doing business, he netted the one at one eighty-five. dollars wow. a year. That's 25 employees. Yeah, that's, that, that's such an incredible thing for, and I don't want to sound like a salesman for diners. I'm, I'm certainly, I'm, I'm not, um, but I, 
I, I am an advocate for small business, right? And and small businesses need all the help they can get, especially in the wake of COVID. Um, and they typically get run over by by government compliance, government regulation. Um, you know, and and a such a key component of any small business P and L as as healthcare, both to attract talent, and retain talent, uh, but also just you know to live and protect your health. You know the 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 type of advice Don is is offering is 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 unbelievably useful, right? It's it's a competitive advantage for business, um, and it's it's better for the employee. And that's where you know I'll go back to Centric is that you know all of a sudden they're 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 having tremendous subsidy to where they're not covering their family currently at a small employer because the employer may pay for Scott's insurance, but he doesn't pay for Scott's family. And, and so the cost has driven all the, I mean, I watched dependents go out the window 10 years ago. You just don't see the cases stacked with dependents. Well, now due to subsidy, I mean, if you can put them on for less than make a family of four in Fort Worth, Texas, the annual health insurance premium is $780. Mm-hmm. If, they, if the household income is 50,000. So you, it is more of a blue collar market, I'll say, you know, keep your dissection. I'm not saying everybody should shift, but I think that people should start, start, trying to figure out a different way. And here's the problem, guys. So, the, so, so this is not a topic like red Corvettes. All right. So people don't want to talk about health insurance. They're in this reactive process to renew and all that stuff. And, and over time, they, they, they don't change. Only 10% of companies change their benefits each year. All right. Mm-hmm. So, so it's, it's going to take some time. The problem, the CAA extended the subsidies to 2025. I'm pretty sure they'll go to 2030. And, and so what, what I'm encouraging people to do is to think about it differently. And, and you know, benefits are different these days. First of all, the employee doesn't want you picking out the insurance company. That's what employers do. They want to pick out multiple insurance companies. They want to pick out their own plan. They want to add other things if they want to that your, your employer may not be offering them. So the hardest thing to get through to the stubborn CEO is that, hey, man, <laughs> this is really good for them. And it's really good for you. Just get the frick out of the health insurance business. You have to communicate it well, but what if you gave them commuter benefits instead? What if you gave them pet insurance or maybe maybe you decide that you, you know, you want to give them more time off or, you know, that's really what they want or or, or more cash incentives. So I will say that the the funding mechanism, guys, is me creating a bucket of money for people saying, hey, you're already spending this. You're spending it grotesquely, actually. There's a different way to do it. You mentioned Kisera, Kisera. Um, what is Quisera? And and tell us really quick about what you said is your shift method, because that is incredibly intriguing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the, 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 there's a shift of responsibility is where I've anchored this. All right. The, 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 the shift is from an employer providing, uh, sponsoring and contributing towards a group health plan to shifting off that platform thus making their employees eligible for significant subsidies that are in the okay. market. Okay. And so we, we had this discussion. So you shift a large population onto subsidies, but that just causes another problem for our society, right? We're, we're deficit spending like drunken sailors right now. And um, eventually, if a huge chunk of population goes over, that's going to contribute a gigantic amount to um, deficit spending. And make uh, it worse, right? Butterfly effect, but you know, I'm really just trying to save people some money in a very high cost environment right now. Yeah, yeah, no, not, doubt. it's not going to fix the long term, though. You're absolutely correct. Okay, so so one more thing too. Um, uh, you talked about the yeah, you one... know, the monetary mo- monetary modern monetary theory says it will will never suffer inflation as a result of deficit. Oh wait, yeah, uh, that's right. Uh, well, okay. healthcare healthcare is 19.7 percent of GDP right now, guys. That's okay, so in the 60s, it was 5%. And exactly. it hovered there for a number of years. So if, if you, you know, why? Well, we, we have modern medicine, as you can call it, some of the best health care and hospitals and doctors and stuff in the system. But the system's broken, guys. That, that's what I'm trying to communicate is the sure. system is broken. It is unsustainable from a financial standpoint. I know that yep. y'all don't see what I see like behind the curtain, but I can tell you I'm not proud of it, but there's several people that are paying two, three, Four thousand dollars a month to have a family covered. So it's not That's uncommon good. to hurt here twenty five grand a year I'm spending for health care. The other dirty secret is, is that you know there, you can't have much you know more than eighty one fifty out of your pocket right now. So if you ask me for what would fix it earlier in our conversation, 
actually yeah. releasing that limit to where I could buy a $25,000 deductible plan if I'm healthy for 200 bucks again. However, I understand the legislation. My mom's a three-time cancer survivor. When she's in there getting the knife, I sure as heck don't want her to have more than 8150. So there's this yin yang thing that, that happens here. But, but you bring up a good point because that's the way people used to think about it is I don't really need insurance for this stuff. I'll pay cash unless it's catastrophic. And, yes. and that to me was a big change to the market is because that's all I ever cared about was I'm a healthy guy. I, I'll, I'll handle the catastrophic, which keeps my costs relatively low. Yeah, but my basic stuff I pay for in cash. But but right. true this statement. kind of okay. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, your true statement is that, that you know catastrophic back in the days used you know used to be a high deductible health plan, right? And that's still the vote right now. Yeah. The problem is the cost didn't go down. You know, we took more risk in our plan design, and mm -hmm. we limited the high risk exposure is what the government's protecting us from. But y'all know as well as I do, there's only 20 percent of the people utilizing the plans. They're, you know, the 80 yeah. percent are not. So Quisera, just to define it though, to answer your question. So it's the qualified self, uh, excuse me, qualified small employer health care reimbursement arrangement, QSEHRA. It came out in the ACA? That, that's inside the ACA. It came out, it came right out right in 2016. It was one of Obama's last pieces of legislation and it came out of the 21st Century Cures Act. So the okay. 21st Century Cures Act in 2016 birthed the Quisera. And, 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 you know, I'll ask your audience, you know, has anybody heard about it? 99% of the people are going to tell me no. So yeah, how is that, that, that question from a traditional, how is that different, Don, from a traditional HRA? Uh, and, the and fact let's, let's, just, let's just explain what an HRA is for those who may not be familiar. Okay, so a traditional healthcare reimbursement arrangement, like back in the 70s, uh, IRC code, uh, you know, is com most commonly used. Uh, to have the employer say, hey, Curtis, we're going to raise your deductible from 500 to 1,000 this year because we got a rate increase, but we put 500 bucks aside in a, a separate account over here called an HRA. So if and when you use it, bring me a receipt and I'll reimburse you for that. Okay? So basically, okay. hey, I met my $1,000 deductible. The employer saved money on their premium by taking the higher deductible. Uh, they didn't have to reimburse you until they you used it. And then even better, if you didn't use it, it went back into general assets of the company that year. Same and fundamental and how is concept. it how is it similar or different to a, as well to a, a health savings account, HSA? Uh, uh, I can do this all day long for you. Health savings accounts are uh, it could be employee money or employer money or it could be your grandma's money. It doesn't matter who puts the money in an HSA. That employee is vested from day one. So basically, the employer drops money in the bucket. It's their, their money when they leave the next day, for instance. Um, it is specifically for medical, dental, vision expenses. And, and uh, there's triple tax to an HSA. Tax deduct what goes in, tax deferred inside, and then you, you tax free on the back end coming out. An HRA is different in the fact that it's just employer money. The employer defines who's eligible for what, just dental, not anything else, for instance. Uh, how long do they have to be here before they're eligible and how much? And then they can class. So as an owner, I would tell your audience that I can take a bigger amount each year than I give my employees if I want to. 5000 for me and my family, $1,000 for every employee. Um, okay, so that's HSA, HRA. Now tell us about Kisera's. So Kisera, going back to your HRA model, is, is basically it's just employer money. And what changed, to answer your question, was the 21st Century Cures Act made premiums an eligible deduction for the employer now. Before them, you couldn't put premiums. You were only reimbursed on claims. And now the employer can reimburse their employee for premiums to go buy their health insurance plan on the exchange. Okay, so in those, there's the, there's a limit on one to 50 people um, within your company. in Texas. So... I'll just say this out loud for aspiring politicians or those people that are politically active. One of the ways to expand these capabilities and the ability to have flexibility with your business is expand that limit from 50 to 100 to 1,000, whatever it is, um, that that would have a significant effect on your ability to choose what you need. Yeah, and that's very intuitive. And I'll share with you that the government, because I've read this stuff, when you're over 50 employees, it's just not the fact that if you dump your group health plan that you'll have to pay because you're not playing by having a group health plan. And the fines, uh, last time I looked, were like 
2650 per employee per year. But but the, the 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 real thing is that the QCERA legislation specifically says that if your employer is an ALE, an applicable large employer, they can't do a QCERA. So think about what the government did. They only segmented this for that small group market. And if you if, if I went and taught people how to get rid of their plan and get rid of the penalties, I could still show you ROI. But there's that little caveat that the government won't let you. So I, I commend you and agree with you because flexibility was the most important word you said there is that now I have the choice of what I do and how I do it. Yeah. And we could That's keep the on new extending. Donut hole. <laughs> That's the new donut hole. <laughs> donut hole is about Medicare Part D. And Scott, this is, this is something that we face all the time. We walk into businesses and one of the first questions we get asked is, you know, how can you reduce my hard costs? And don't mm -hmm. talk to me about cost avoidance. Don't talk to me about, you know, squishy costs that may happen. Talk to me about how I reduce this number next quarter, right? And that, that's exactly what Don's talking about. And I think that's, that's the kind of common sense business consulting that small businesses and medium-sized businesses especially need. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's well worth, uh, well worth a look. If you haven't done your research, do so. If you need help, reach out to Don. But, um, you know, this is, this is good stuff. Key, key is still attracting talent. So I feel you, Scott, even though you're not saying anything. So the key still still to attract talent. Um, but, you know, so. it's been proven, guys, that a poor plan with good communication has a higher perceived value than a good plan with poor communication. So that's what's really happening is that, you know, if you want to be engaged and get that stick factor, that retention factor, um, you're going to have to start giving these people more choices. And that's been always my obstacle in the equation is I sit in between that employee and that employer. I want to make sure the employer doesn't go bankrupt, make sure the employee doesn't get everything right. But there's a balance in there. And I, the, the number one fallacy that I see over decades is that the owners are not even asking them. They're not asking them, would you rather have, you know, the choice of insurance carriers? And what if they told you that? Don't you feel silly writing that $25,000 check to Blue Cross that month? Yeah. So there's, yeah. they're going to have to have an open mindset. And, you know, the number one thing that happens is people don't understand insurance. So they don't ask questions. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good stuff. Don, tell us, uh, tell our audience where they can find, find you, find more about this and find that excellent Wagyu beef jerky. Yeah. Um, so I'm pretty well off the grid. I like to do private stuff. So I don't really do social media and you'll find a LinkedIn account if you want to see some of that stuff. But um, I, you know, y'all find me through this network right here, actually. So my email address will be published. You mentioned, right. And, uh, my phone number will be on there as well. And, uh, since y'all know Curtis and Scott, y'all get access to my content about a year ago, I stopped writing for everybody out there and giving away my chocolate chip cookies. So I'm, I'm still willing to share and help educate people, but I, I collectively put them in a network as opposed to mass marketing stuff. So, uh, candidate Silicon benefits.com or, Dial my 817-357-8242 phone number and be happy to have a conversation if Scott and Curtis sent you. That sounds Very great. Good. Thanks Very so good. much, Don. Really appreciate coming by today. Appreciate y'all having me on the show. It's been fun. I think what y'all are doing is fantastic and uh, it's very polished. And uh, like I mentioned in some, some, some email communications, y'all two really meld well together from a front stage experience as a consumer. So, uh, you know, the trick with what y'all are trying to do is, is, is it engaging to get people to watch, right? So I think y'all are doing it. And um, hopefully I'll get a few of my friends to join the network as well. We love hey, it. That'd Thanks. be great, Don. That'd be Thanks great. Thanks so much. Welcome. Good catching up with you. We'll talk you to you too, soon, my friend. Thank you. Y'all have a great day, guys. All Take right. Care. From Curtis and I, thanks so much for joining us today on The Outspoken Show with Scott and Curtis. And uh, again, just like Don said, don't forget to tell your friends about us. And until next time, take care. Bye. Bye for now.